Biology 101 Lecture 5. Hello students. Today we're going to summarize uh, what we were talking about last time, which were carbohydrates, and go on to the other important biomolecules. Um, so we're going to start with uh, just a summary uh, of carbohydrates. And um, oh, when we talked about carbohydrates last time, we said that they were made out of monomers, um, they serve as fuel, and they also serve as building material. And um, there's a little picture of a monosaccharide monomer. Um, so it has six carbon um, atoms, and they're linked in a ring form, um, in the form of a nice, beautiful ring. Um, and uh, the most common examples of monosaccharides would be glucose and fructose, uh, which go on uh, to make disaccharides like sucrose. Um, and uh, we can also have lactose as a disaccharide. Uh, polysaccharides would be those um, that um, are in plants. They would be expressed as cellulose in uh, starch. Uh, that's also in plants. That's a, um, cellulose is more of a building material, whereas starch is um, a repository of fuel. Um, and in the same way, in animals, uh, the carbohydrates can be uh, the storage carbohydrates would be the glycogen, um, or uh, for structural support, we have chitin. Um, those are usually in exoskeleton of bugs uh, or a fungus. And, um, and now we're going to go on to the more interesting things, um, well, sequentially. But first, we're going to talk about lipids. So lipids are uh, kind of important. They're uh, a class of large biological molecules that do not have polymers. So uh, they're not true polymers because they don't, they're not cons composed of monomers as uh, carbohydrates um, and amino acids are. Um, but they do contain uh, the classes of chemicals called fats, steroids, and phospholipids. Um, the biggest common characteristic of lipids is that they are hydrophobic. Um, they have, uh, they're made out of hydrocarbons um, and hydrocarbons, as we remember, form nonpolar covalent bonds. So uh, there's no charge, there's an equal sharing of electrons, and therefore uh, they're hydrophobic. Um, water molecules, on the other hand, are not um, like that. They form polar covalent bonds. Um, the, the electrons are not equally shared. And so um, they hydrogen bond to each other, but they will not hydrogen bond uh, fat molecules. Fats are uh, formed from two types of smaller molecules, glycerols and fatty acids. Um, a glycerol is a three carbon alcohol. Okay, as you can see on the left hand bottom side of the screen, um, there are three carbons and it's an alcohol. It's, it has a hydroxyl group attached to each carbon. A fatty acid, which is depicted on the bottom lower right, um, as a zigzag and also uh, filled in a little bit, um, that has a carboxyl group attached to a long carbon skeleton. So the zigzag actually just represents carbon, 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 carbon bonding. And then uh, that one double bonded oxygen that you see um, is uh, on one side of it uh, along with an OH group. So that becomes um, a carboxyl group. And as you can see over here, um, at the bottom, there's the same, the same depiction, but uh, slightly more detail. Uh, so how do we get um, a lipid? We would combine a glycerol with three fatty acids. So here we see three fatty acids. So you can see the pretty chain, so carbon, 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 hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen in the fatty acids, um, with their carboxyl groups uh, moving in and towards the glycerol. Um, and they're going to bond with the OH group um, and uh, water will be removed and it will uh, become a nice bond like this. So here we are, we have a fatty acid moving on in to the glycerol. Um, in this case, the fatty acid, it's called palmitic acid. Um, it's going to remove one of the H's from um, uh, the um, OH group at uh, the glycerol and it's going to remove an OH group um, from the carbon uh, and uh, that will become one molecule of water. 
So that is a dehydration reaction, and it will make three linkages. Uh, these linkages are called ester linkages. And so uh, we end up with a nice fat molecule called triacyl glycerol. And so here is the fatty acid um, close up. Um, it's going to undergo a dehydration reaction to join up with the glycerol molecule uh, in an ester linkage. Um, and uh, so we have three ester linkages in this fat molecule called triacyl glycerol. Fatty acids uh, in, th in that fat, in any fat, can be all the same. Or um, they can be different kinds. Each one of them can be different, or they can be two da the same and one different, or two different and one, one uh, well, then that would be all the same different. Um, and fatty acids vary in length in the sense that the number of carbons attached um, can, be, um, uh, can differ. And the, n and the locations of the double bond can also differ. There are two types of fatty acids, uh, saturated and unsaturated. The saturated fatty acids have the maximum number of hydrogen atoms possible, so therefore they have no double bond. But the unsaturated fatty acids have one, at least one, double bond, or maybe more. And here are two examples of saturated and unsaturated uh, fatty acids. So the saturated fatty acid, that would be butter. And when you look at it, um, there are no double bonds at all. And it has bonded up with the glycerol molecule um, and uh, it's nice and straight. So what we see on the left-hand side is a representation of an unsaturated fat that would be maybe olive oil. Um, and in here, what we see is uh, the glycerol is bonded with, with three fatty acids, but one of them is different. And that actually has a kink in it because of uh, a double bond, a cis uh, linkage will cause that kink. And that is um, really good because it becomes an unsaturated fatty acid, and uh, those are healthier for us. The next slide actually just shows you um, the, s the difference between the saturated fat uh, in the chemical formula and configuration, and then uh, again the unsaturated fat. And what you see is that a pretty kink, which uh, makes all the difference. Fats that are made from saturated fatty acids are usually solid at room temperature. Most animal fats are saturated. But fats that are made from unsaturated fatty acids um, are called unsaturated fats. And at room temperature, they're usually liquid. So those would be fats from plants and fats from fish. So uh, if we eat diets rich in saturated fats, mm, there is a small problem because they deposit fat and can cause heart disease. disease. Whereas um, if our diets have more unsaturated fats, um, that's a little bit better. We can convert an unsaturated fat to a saturated fat by adding hydrogen. Um, and so sometimes you can find in the grocery stores hydrogenated uh, fats. Um, but uh, they also c create um, unsaturated fats uh, with uh, trans double bonds, not cis but trans, and um, those are actually really bad for us because they contribute more to heart disease than saturated fats, though all at the time it seems like a good idea when you buy it because it says, you know, we can't digest it, so hey, we're not gonna get fat, but um, we will get sick. So some essential unsaturated fatty acids that are not synthesized in the human body, um, and we must eat them, are uh, the omega-3 omega fatty acids. We ha have to have them um, in, our, in our diets. Um, the major function of fats is energy storage. Um, it's usually stored as in a special cell called adipose cells. So adipose cells are not exactly, um, they have a bad rap. They, <laughs> they don't really uh, contribute to us being fat as such. Um, because obesity doesn't depend on our weight, but the amount of adipose tissue. 
Um, adipose tissue is actually pretty good because uh, it insulates the body, it cushions organs, and so it does serve a purpose other than um, it helps to keep our temperature regulated. Um, so uh, it's not bad. Um, it, uh, too much of anything is bad, but adipose tissue is where the fat is stored. Um, phospholipids, which are another kind of lipids, but very important, and they're usually um, referred to in membranes. They have two fatty acids and a phosphate group, and they're attached to a glycerol molecule. The two fatty acid tails are hydrophobic, but the phosphate group um, and its attachments are hydrophilic. So they look like this. And you've seen this picture before. Um, the hydrophilic head and the hydrophobic tails, um, the tail with a kink in it. And uh, so the hydrophobic tails will um, bond, sort of uh, bond with each other the, because the hydrophilic heads are going to protect the membrane from the outside environment and also from the inside environment. So it's a, a nice layer, a double layer, um, that will keep the outside out and the inside in. Um, and the hydrophobic tails are all uh, bunched up together. We'll look, we'll look at those tails uh, in uh, a couple more chapters. Here is a close-up of that exact um, cute little uh, phospholipid symbol. So uh, if you look at what the nice gray head was, which looks like a perfect oval um, in the diagram, um, it actually is composed of choline, and then there's uh, a phosphate group, and then there's a glycerol group. So it's actually um, uh, three things, but we call it the hydrophilic head. And then the two fatty acids that join up with the glycerol, um, one of them has a kink in it um, because it has a cis double bond, as you can see. So here it is um, blown up even more. Um, so you can actually see uh, how interesting this, this molecule is. Phospholipids have this really amazing f uh, ability. They can self-assemble in water into double layer structures called bilayers. And so that uh, the thinking is that um, uh, if phospholipids were formed in the beginning of time when Earth was starting out and life was starting out, then if a phospholipid molecule was able to be formed, um, they would immediately start enclosing areas um, and uh, keeping stuff inside. So then you would have the beginnings of a, a cell or a protocell. Um, so uh, at the surface of any cell, uh, there are phospholipids. They're arranged in a bilayer. And the hydrophobic tails are always pointing to the interior. Also in the category of fats um, and lipids are steroids. So steroids are these um, exotic lipids. Um, they have uh, three pentose rings and one, um, I'm sorry, three hexose rings and one pentose ring along with a chain. So um, in the picture here is depicted cholesterol, which uh, is present in animal cell membranes and it's also a precursor from what other uh, steroids are synthesized from. And you can see that it is, it has three benzene rings and one uh, pentose ring um, along with that uh, methylated side chain. So to summarize lipids, they're diverse, um, they're hydrophobic, uh, they, their components are glycerol and fatty acids. The heads um, has a, have a phosphate group and so um, they are a negative, um, and the tails are fatty acid, two fatty acid uh, long limbs, and uh, one has a kink in it due to a double bond, a cis double bond, and um, you can find them uh, in um, oils and butters, uh, but their functions are, the first of all, it's an important energy source, uh, second, they usually form uh, membranes, um, and they also um, can become hormones. And uh, so um, they can act for signaling for the entire body. The next most cool group is proteins, and this is a fabulous group of biomolecules. 
they account for more than 50% of the dry mass of uh, most cells. So that's a lot of proteins that we have. Um, we know that some, we already know that some protein, proteins speed up chemical reactions and are called enzymes. But did we know that proteins also, um, uh, they are used for defense, they're used for storage, they're used for transport, they're used for communication between cells, they're used for movement, and they're used for structural support. So proteins seem to be a real nice general multi-purpose molecule. So uh, we'll look at these um, selectively one by one and run through these rather fast. So proteins can function as enzymes, as we already know. What they do is they speed up chemical reactions that were already going to happen. Um, we have examples of proteins, uh, of enzymes in digestion. Um, and what they do is um, they take a substrate um, and they will um, lower the activation energy of that reaction and the substrate then becomes products really rapidly. They are also used as a defense against disease because they uh, form antibodies which inactivate um, bacteria and viruses uh, that uh, do invade us. They are also used for storage. So um, uh, there are storage proteins, and those are special ones. Um, the example given is casein. That's a protein of milk. And that's a major source of amino acids for our babies. Plants also have storage proteins in their seeds. Um, we eat them all the time. Um, and uh, then there are transport proteins. Transport proteins would be things like hemoglobin which actually go and transport oxygen, um, and other proteins transport other molecules here and there and everywhere. Then we also have, in the next group, um, proteins that are hormones. So um, hormones, for instance, uh, they will go and regulate the entire body or uh, that particular area. Um, then proteins can also be receptors. So uh, they respond to chemical stimuli and they would be actually built into the membrane of cells so they can actually um, receive a signal and then um, make sense of it. Um, proteins that are really cool are the contractile pr and motor proteins which are responsible for movement. Um, so a lot of uh, unicellular animals um, they have uh, flagella and cilia, and uh, they move the same way as the hair that we also have inside us. Um, and uh, that is by the action of two proteins, actin and myosin. And we'll look at that sometime later as to exactly how that those work, but um, it is a really cool way that those proteins work. And then, of course, there are structural proteins. Um, we have uh, keratin, which is a protein that we know is in our hair. Um, we also know that uh, structural proteins are in feathers, um, horn, for instance, and so on. Um, spiders spin their silk from uh, structural proteins and um, elastin and collagen. These are all things that we all need uh, for our own structure and our own support of our own bodies. So proteins seem to do an awful lot of things. Uh, but they're all constructed from the same set of 20 amino acids. So the alphabet to create the protein language um, is just from 20 amino acids. Uh, so the English alphabet is out of 26, and we can get this gigantic encyclopedia or a dictionary from um, just 26 letters arranged in uh, words that make sense. Well, amino acids are made out of, um, are, are there are 20 types of amino acids, and they can make just as many, if not many, proteins. So a protein is a biologically functional molecule that has one or more polypeptides. And polypeptides are unbranched polymers built from amino acids. Um, and there are only 20 amino acids that all proteins are constructed from. So they're constructed, constructed from the same set um, of amino acids. Amino acids are organic molecules with amino and carboxyl groups. So it's a 
carbon molecule um, and it has um, an amino group as you can see on the left hand side and a carboxyl group as you can see on the right hand side but there's one other difference they have a side chain called an R group um, and then the last uh, um, available set of side groups is the hydrogen but the R group is what makes each amino acid distinct. Everything else is basically the same. So um, oh, here are some uh, groups of amino acids out of those 20. We can break them up into a few groups. They can be hydrophobic. So the side chain um, can uh, be hydrophobic and those would be just the uh, um, a row of amino acids on top like glycine, alanine, valine, leucine, or isoleucine. They are all hydrophobic. Or you, you can have hydrophilic um, amino acids, and that's the next row down, uh, methionine, phenylalanine, tryptophan, and uh, proline. These are all hydrophilic protein, um, sorry, amino acids. And then uh, you can have uh, electrically charged, oh, and then there's another row at the bottom too. Um, but we're not uh, thinking of those so much, but we're looking at um, the electrically charged side chains. So those would be hydrophilic too. They're not polar, they're electrically charged. And they're, uh, those would be serine, threonine, cysteine, tyrosine, asparagine, and glutamine. Um, but um, at the very bottom of the page, you see two groups. Uh, they're acidic or they're basic. So this is kind of cool. We have amino acids that are acidic, like aspartic acid or glutamic acid. Gl glutamic acid actually comes from glutamine, which you see in the middle of the, the slide as a hydrophilic electrically ch charged side chain. And then uh, we have um, amino acids that are basic or positively charged like lysine, arginine, and histidine. So the reason we have different side groups um, is that proteins can therefore do a whole host of different functions uh, because then they can actually do many, 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 many things. So here are the nonpolar side chain proteins. They're all hydrophobic. Okay. And then here are uh, the polar side chain uh, proteins. They're all hydrophilic. And here are the electrically charged side chains. There's, these are all hydrophilic. And actually, I have this uh, link, which I don't know will work or not today. Um, but I can try it. Let's see. Does it work? Mm. I don't know. I don't know if I can get it to work. Let me see. So I think I'm just going to um, do it the old-fashioned way, which is uh, open the hyperlink and hope that it works.
Um, but we're going to go on to real stuff, which is polypeptides. So amino acids are linked by covalent bonds, and we know that covalent bonds are these nice, strong, sturdy bonds. And um, But when they join two amino acids together, they are called peptide bonds. Um, so when many amino acids are joined like that, um, then it becomes a polymer of amino acids. And instead of saying a polymer of amino acids, we just say polypeptide. Um, uh, polypeptides can be a few monomers or can have thousands of monomers. So it can, the ver length does vary. And each polypeptide has a unique linear sequence of amino acids, but they always have a carboxyl end, which is called a C-terminus, and an amino end, which is the N-terminus. And so here we are with a picture of a peptide bond forming. Uh, between two amino acids. Um, one has already been formed, uh, but this is uh, the third amino acid that's going to be joined up. And so um, here is a new peptide bond forming. Water is being removed, and you end up with um, uh, a trimer, a um, um, polymer, a polypeptide of three amino acids. Um, the N terminus is on the left hand side, and the carboxyl terminus, the C terminus, is on the right hand side. Here we see um, a close-up of that water molecule being taken away to form a peptide bond, a nice peptide bond, um, which is very, very nice because it's covalent and therefore very sturdy. Um, the specific activities of proteins result from their 3D structure. So um, a, a functional protein will have one or more of these polypeptides but those polypeptides are going to be very, very uh, precisely twisted, folded, coiled, and uh, otherwise um, configured around in 3D space. And that is actually what, c what determines what that polypeptide can actually do, uh, what function it, it holds, and what work it can actually do. So the function depends on its ability to recognize and to bind to some other molecule. Um, here are some um, uh, pictures of one, one, the same uh, protein called lysozyme, which is an enzyme. Um, and uh, it is present in tears. And on the left-hand side, you can see it represented as a ribbon mo model uh, with a groove in it. And then in the center, it's uh, more of a space-filling model. And the groove is still there. And then uh, on the extreme right, you see a wireframe model uh, with the target molecule sitting inside. Um, so the ribbon molecule is usually my favorite way to look at things because you can actually see the coils um, and the straight parts, and you can um, see where the grooves and the things are in, in uh, 3D space, so you can visualize it much better. Um, the space-filling model is OK um, in the sense that it actually gives you an idea of how big um, this molecule is in space, uh, not quite like that ribbon thing we just saw. So this is more realistic. Um, and the wireframe model, um, this is one of my least favorite ones, but uh, it is very cool because if you really just want to see where the target molecule is or what is actually happening, then you might want to reduce all the way down to a uh, wireframe model because it, it depicts it a whole lot better. And you don't have to um, be considering, well, is this a, a nice loop? Or is this a, a data sheet? Or is it a what? So here we can just uh, focus on what we actually need to do. Um, here is an actual antibody protein um, binding on um, the uh, right-hand side with a nasty old flu virus protein. So the antibody protein, if you look at the very center of the blue and orange parts, um, that forms a nice little pocket. And the protein from the flu virus is going to fit exactly in that little pocket. And so um, it will become deactivated. There are four levels of protein structure. Uh, the primary structure of a protein is its unique sequence of amino acids. So um, it could be proline, proline, cysteine, histi histidine, uh, and that would be its unique sequence. And then the next protein could be completely different, like glycine, um, leucine, 
and um, choline. So that would be completely different protein. It will do different things. So that's the primary structure of a protein. And the secondary structure of uh, proteins um, is found in most proteins, and it consists of coils and folds in that primary structure polypeptide chain. And the tertiary structure is determined by interactions between the various side groups, the side chains uh, that each amino acid has. And the quaternary structure results when a protein consists of multiple polypeptide chains. Okay, so we're going to look at this one by one. Um, and here we see um, a, what looks like a row of beads, and um, that is the primary structure. So you can see there's the amino end and the carboxyl end. And um, if we read the proteins, uh, the amino acids from uh, 1 to 5, it's glycine, proline, threonine, glycine, threonine. And it's going to keep on going until it gets to the very end. Uh, 125 is proline, then lysine, and uh, glutamine. So and this is uh, just one primary structure. Okay, That's just um, a, a row of, of amino acids linked together, uh, and they look like mm, pearls on a string. And the secondary structure occurs because of hydrogen bonds. And these hydrogen bonds will occur between um, the um, um, amino acids themselves that are in the primary structure. So if you look at it, you can see on the left-hand side, there are two types of secondary structure. You can either have an alpha helix or a beta-plated sheet. Um, in the beta-plated sheet, the protein actually folds over on itself, um, and it becomes like a pleat. Uh, whereas the alpha helix is just like a, a, a helix. And then we'll go on to tertiary structures, which um, will then um, ultimately result in a quaternary structure. And uh, we'll look at all of those carefully. So the primary structure is like the order of letters in a long word. And that is determined by genetic information. So that is coded for by the DNA. And it would look like this. Um, and the secondary structure results from hydrogen bonds uh, between uh, the polypeptide backbone. And you get uh, an alpha helix sheet, or which is a coil, um, or a folded structure called a beta pleated sheet that looks like this. And uh, the tertiary structure, uh, which is the overall shape of the polypeptide, results from interactions between the R groups, not between the backbone constituents. So that's the difference between secondary and tertiary. The secondary is interactions between the backbone constituents, uh, whereas the tertiary structure is a result of interactions between the R groups, the side chains. And those um, include hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, hydrophobic interactions, van der Waals interactions. Um, and we have strong covalent bonds also in the primary structure and in the tertiary structure called disulfide bonds. They reinforce the structure of the protein. Um, so uh, this is going to show you how each subunit of the alpha helix and the beta sheets fold in space. Let me see if I can, no, it's not going to cooperate, so I'll have to do it the old-fashioned way, um, but that's okay. <laughs> Proteins are single-chain polymers composed of monomers called amino acids. A condensation reaction forms a peptide bond and releases water. Each of the 20 amino acids has a unique shape and chemistry. Some are hydrophobic, some are hydrophilic. Some are big and some are small. These 20 amino acids bind in different combinations to form many different proteins. 
primary structure is the amino acid sequence. Here we see a protein assembling one amino acid at a time. The side chain size is part of what determines how a protein folds. Secondary structure refers to local substructures, such as helices and sheets, held together with hydrogen bonds. Tertiary structure is the globular unit into which the amino acid chain folds. Each unit is held together by disulfide bridges and ionic bonds. Quaternary structure describes the association between subunits. Each subunit is a separate amino acid chain. Hemoglobin has four subunits, forming a tetramer. Specific function is due to specific shape. Here are two examples. Ribonuclease A is a monomer. Its function is to chop RNA into smaller pieces. The active site is in this cleft region. Insulin is another example. It is stored in our bodies as a hexamer, but its functional unit is a monomer. In this video, we'll look at the structure of proteins and we'll start with the primary structure. The primary structure of a protein refers to the number and sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide chain. The bond responsible for the primary structure is the peptide bond. So here we have an example of a dipeptide formed from alanine and glycine and the bond responsible for joining the two amino acids is the peptide bond. So next we have the secondary structure of proteins. The secondary structure of a protein refers to the folding of the polypeptide chain as a result of hydrogen bonding. The two main types of structure are the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. On the left here we have the alpha helix structure and we have a hydrogen bond between this oxygen and this hydrogen atom. On the right we have the hydrogen bond in the beta pleated sheet between this hydrogen and this oxygen atom. So next we have the tertiary structure of proteins. The tertiary structure refers to the interactions between the R groups, which are known as side chains. The tertiary structure is the folding of the secondary structure to form a specific 3D shape. So here are some of the interactions that form the tertiary structure. We have hydrogen bonding, we have hydrophobic or van der Waals forces, we have a disulfide bridge between two atoms of sulfur, and we also have ionic bonding, and in addition we have a peptide bond and we'll look at these in more detail now. So here's a list of the interactions that form the tertiary structure. We have hydrophobic interactions, or van der Waals forces, between non-polar side chains. We have hydrogen bonding between polar side chains. Ionic bonding between chains that have opposite charges. Disulfide bridges between sulfur atoms in cysteine. These are covalent bonds and therefore the strongest type of interaction. And finally, we have peptide bonds between NH2 and COOH groups. And finally, we have the quaternary structure of proteins. So proteins such as collagen, which we have on the left here, and hemoglobin on the right, they're composed of more than one polypeptide chain. The interactions between the polypeptide chains give rise to the quaternary structures. And I have one more, which is also very interesting. Proteins are building blocks that help give your body structure and do work around your body. They move molecules, they make new molecules, they recycle old molecules, and this is just to name a few of the things that they do. But maybe the most interesting thing is that these protein building blocks are themselves made up of smaller building blocks called amino acids. Here you can see a string of amino acids. The different shapes that you can see represent the atoms that make up each amino acid. And here we've highlighted 12 individual amino acids. To make it simpler, each different amino acid can be represented by a single letter. Now each amino acid is shown as a colored ball, looking like beads on a string. 
This makes the protein structure easier to imagine. The order of amino acids is only part of the story. Because of the different shapes of the individual amino acids, they like to fold into even more interesting three-dimensional shapes. This molecule is twisting into several different spiral or helical shapes, and then those are folding on each other. Take a look at the three-dimensional shape as we give the protein a spin. Kind of looks like logs stacked in a fireplace. Here is the one-letter amino acid code revealing the identity of each amino acid. Again now you see the amino acids drawn to show the position of each atom. This is like looking at an atomic skeleton of each amino acid. Just like you take up more space than just your skeleton would, see how much space each atom really occupies. This is the real shape of the protein. Now we've seen an example of a protein taking shape, and several of the ways scientists visualize these tiny building blocks used throughout your body. And here, finally, is the last one. I liked it a lot. It's completely silent, but it spins the um, protein. It sh does the exact same stuff that uh, was in the previous one, but here it's, it's much more magnified. So you can actually see uh, the backbone and you can see the direction of uh, the helical sheets, uh, the helical the helices and the beta sheets, and um, the bonds in between. Um, so I thought this was uh, very pretty, uh, but it doesn't have sound. However, it, I uh, thought it, it was a very good depiction of uh, protein structure, of primary, secondary, uh, tertiary, and quaternary folding. Um, so what we see here um, in this is the red part is uh, a helix, and here is the actual 3D uh, space that that protein is taking. Um, and then again, we're down to, so these are two units that are linked up, so that's the quaternary structure of uh, that protein. Um, and. Uh, um, the wireframe model to show you where the actual molecules are. All right, so uh, we're going to go into uh, looking at tertiary structure a little bit more. Um, there is a, a hemoglobin, as we know, is does have a quaternary structure. Um, myoglobin also has a tertiary structure, and here are some examples. Um, there is another example of uh, hair. So all of us have hair, so we're all really very interested in it. And it's made of uh, a protein called alpha keratin. And the reason we have straight, curly, or wavy hair is because of disulfide bonds. Did you know that um, they naturally form in, in the alpha keratin? So if you want to straighten your hair because you don't like it to be curly, um, you, what you're really doing is you're trying to break those disulfide bonds. Um, you think that you could denature the protein by heating it, because that's how proteins denature, um, but not, not the disulfide bonds. They're harder to break. So what you really would have to do is chemically break them and then uh, chemically reform them into a new, a new shape. So um, what you would have to do is go to a hairdresser who would reduce the disulfide bonds and then oxidize them um, to form, uh, oxidize the hair to form new disulfide bonds in a new configuration. Um, the new configuration is not going to be a favorable one, so it's not going to be the most energy efficient one, uh, and so therefore it will um, tend to break um, more than uh, the uh, configuration that your hair is uh, naturally falling into. Um, and also, since it's not permanent, um, the new hair that keeps going out from its, your roots uh, will come out the regular way and not the, the way that you wanted it to be. So you'd have to keep on going to the hairdresser. Um, the tertiary structure of this particular protein is shown like that. Uh, here is a summary slide showing uh, primary structure on the very left, um, where it's just a string of amino acids. And then uh, the secondary structure where those um, 
uh, that string will form hydrogen bonds um, between the backbone, not the R group, and then the tertiary structure is where bonds are formed, all kinds of bonds, ionic, hydrophobic, van der Waals, um, between uh, the uh, R groups. And then a quaternary structure is merely taking separate units of uh, the tertiary structures and uh, binding them together and making them into one great big protein. Not all proteins get to the quaternary structures. Some proteins don't make it all that way. They don't need to be that big, so they don't have to have that. Um, here is another picture um, of the tertiary structure and the bonds. So we have hydrogen bonds, we have disulfide bridges, we have hydrophobic interactions, van der Waals interactions, ionic bonds, and then of course this is all on the polypeptide backbone. Um, so the difference between the quaternary structure and the other structures is you're just taking a finished unit and you're adding those units together. So those units are really then called subunits. Um, and so they make up um, a big, big, really big protein. Um, it, and the way these uh, units fit together, it's sort of like a puzzle. Collagen is a fibrous protein and has three polypeptides and they're coiled like a rope. And they look like a rope. A hemoglobin is a globular protein and has four polypeptides, two alpha and two beta chains. And uh, some uh, proteins, if they're only made out of one chain, then of course there's no quaternary structure for it. The uh, forces that hold the different chains together um, in quaternary, stru quaternary structures are the same uh, forces that hold the tertiary structure together. There'll be the same hydrogen bonding between the polar R groups, the same ionic bonds between the charged R groups, the same hydrophobic interactions between nonpolar R groups, and the same disulfide bonds if that's necessary. Here is a, a picture of a quaternary structure protein, and that's hemoglobin. And each subunit is colored a different color, as you can see. Um, and you can see that there are four iron um, uh, units inside. Uh, the, the red, uh, thin-looking structures are supposed to depict the iron. Um, and then you see the alpha chains and the beta chains. Um, so here uh, is the same hemoglobin. Um, we're taking it out of a red blood cell, and what you see are um, the alpha and beta subunits and the heme ions um, inside. Um, another picture of quaternary structure, the collagen on the left, and uh, another uh, transferrin protein on the right. Um, well, uh, there is a very interesting um, disease called sickle cell anemia, and that results from a very tiny s change in the primary structure of the protein, and so it doesn't fold all the way right, and so it can't do all the functions it, it was supposed to do. It, sickle cell disease is inherited, and it results from a single amino acid substitution in the protein. Um, so instead of uh, here you see the normal one on the top and then uh, the abnormal protein um, at the bottom where there's one substitution at number six instead of glut um, glutamine you get val valine um, and so that results in a completely different fold for that um, subunit and unfortunately um, it cannot do its function correctly. However, um, it can fight malaria very effic effectively. So sickle cell anemia is usually restricted to the sub-Sahara um, because uh, over there, those people that ha actually had sickle cells, cells um, were more successful in fighting uh, the local infection, which was uh, malaria. Than um, the normal function, which is you know if you're on top of a mountain or something like that, then maybe you would really want those uh, red blood cells to be the right right shape because you could actually take in the oxygen. The uh, protein um, structure, the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures, um, are, are, and therefore the activity of the protein are the direct result of the primary structure. So you need to keep that in mind, that um, 
that is, uh, I mean, it, it's all pretty unfolded, but it's only because there was that initial uh, string of beads on the, on the strings. Um, the phys physical and chemical conditions can also affect protein structure. Uh, things like if you change the pH, if you change the, the uh, concentration, the temperature, or any other environmental factors, um, the protein will unravel. It will denature. And if you denature it, um, it becomes biologically inactive. So here is uh, a normal protein on the left and a denatured or unraveled protein on the right. And you can see that, well, it can't do what it was supposed to do because it's no longer held together by those bonds. And so it's kind of like all over the place. Um, the magic of folding of proteins is actually assisted by uh, another protein called a chaperonin. And uh, they actually uh, ensure that each protein falls exactly right. So we do not have those problems. Uh, most proteins go through several stages on their way to a stable structure. But if we have even one misfold, you can get horrible things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, mad cow disease. And they're all a result of a misfold of protein. And just one, one problem, one tiny little problem, and then the whole thing falls apart. So um, how a chaperone protein works is like this. Um, the chaperone protein is on the left, and it's uh, sort of like a hollow cylinder with a cap on it. And the minute a polypeptide is, is uh, generated by a ribosome, it'll, uh, the cap will fall off. Um, and the polypeptide will pop in and the, the hollow cylinder, the cap will pop back on, and inside the protein will change uh, shape into the exact shape that it should have been uh, because the environment inside is um, uh, hydrophilic and uh, it will cause it to fold correctly. And then the cap will open and the finished protein will pop on out. And so um, that's how proteins actually are helped into folding exactly the right way. So they're formed millions of times a second and we never have any problems. And here is a summary of uh, the proteins that we just studied. They include a diversity of structures, they have a wide range of functions, it's a carbon compound with a carboxyl group and an amino group, and a side chain uh, which is an R side chain um, which can do uh, the many wonderful functions of proteins. Um, proteins are enzymes. They could be structural proteins. They can be hormones. They can be receptors. They can um, be used for locomotion. They're motor proteins. Or proteins can be used for defense. Um, and so uh, proteins are a very, very uh, diversely um, functioned molecule. It's, it's a molecule that is sort of like snake oil. It, it can do just about anything. So now we go on to nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are very important. They're the um, actual molecules that are used for heredity, for passing down information from one generation to the next. Um, the amino acid sequence of a polypeptide uh, is programmed by a gene. And a gene is made out of DNA, which is deoxyribose nucleic acid. Um, a nucleic acid, which is made out of monomers, called nucleotides. Nucleotides have uh, a nitrogen-containing base, and it could be either adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. And besides that nitrogen-containing base, a nucleotide will have a monosaccharide, sugar, called deoxyribose, and it will also have a phosphate group. The nucleotides will join together by covalent bonds between the sugar of one nucleotide and the phosphate of the next. And so you result, you get this resulting backbone of alternated sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. And the bases always pair like this. Under base rules, they have um, adenine will always and always pair with thymine because it makes double bonds with it. And guanine will always and always pair with cytosine because it makes a triple bond. So they cannot bond with anything else. They have to bond with each other. Um, the roles of nucleic acids, uh, well, there are two types. There's DNA, and then there's RNA, which is a ribonucleic acid. Um, so DNA actually provides directions for its own replication. 
And it also directs synthesis of RNA, or messenger RNA, which, is, which codes for protein synthesis. And that is called gene expression. Um, and so this is how it actually works. So uh, on the uh, left-hand side, you have a strand, a single strand of DNA, and it is running um, from top to bottom, from prime, uh, from five prime to the three prime end. Um, so that would be the sensed strand. And then the antisensed strand is um, on the other side, and it's inverted, as you can see. Um, the five prime is at the bottom of the page, and the three prime is at the top of the page. And um, what you have is a backbone, which is highlighted in pink, and that's phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. And you also have um, the nitrogenous bases, which are in the center. And as you can see, the adenine is double bonding with thymine, and the cytosine is triple bonding with guanine in a particular order. So um, the two strands of DNA run anti-parallel to each other. Uh, one is the sense strand and the other is the anti-sense strand. And uh, they always, uh, the sense strand uh, always runs from five prime um, to the three prime group. And uh, uh, there's always a terminal um, five, uh, phosphate group on the five prime end. And the three prime end always has a terminal hydroxyl group. That's how you know that that's the end of that strand. The macromolecule is used for biological information storage. And that is because it's a very stable molecule. Um, and it, the sequence of those four nucleotides actually encodes biological information. Um, it's a very, very stable molecule. Both of the structures, um, both of the strands of DNA store the same information. And within the cells, DNA is organized um, into bigger uh, structures called chromosomes. So the strands will actually uh, coil up really close um, and become these dense um, objects called chromosomes. The reason for that is uh, DNA is very sensitive to ultraviolet radiation and uh, it likes to protect itself and so it will um, coil up when it's inactive or not coding for both proteins and only that part will unravel which uh, needs to be uh, expressed or a protein has to be made for it. Each gene in the DNA strand directs synthesis of one messenger RNA. The messenger RNA actually interacts with the cell's protein synthesizing machinery or the ribosome to direct production of a polypeptide. So the flow of genetic information is summarized as DNA to RNA to protein. There are differences between DNA and RNA. RNA for one is a single strand. DNA is double stranded. RNA does not carry the base thymine. Instead, it carries the base uracil. DNA can carries the sugar deoxyribose, but RNA does not. It carries a ribose sugar, so it has one more oxygen. RNA can move between the nucleus and the cell cytoplasm um, because it gets the information from the nucleus and then it go, wanders off into the cell cytoplasm to uh, go attach to a ribosome to tell it what to do. But the DNA does not move. The DNA always stays inside the nucleus. Um, DNA is responsible for storing information, uh, transferring genetic information, but RNA is responsible for coding for amino acids and it acts as a messenger between DNA and the ribosomes to make proteins. DNA is awfully tightly packed in the nucleus, um, but RNA strands uh, are kind of loose and they're continu continually made, they're continually broken down, and they're continually reused. And therefore, they're more resistant to UV radiation because their job is to move from one place to another. Here's a picture of gene expression. So you see the DNA on the top in the blue a double helix. It synthesizes a strand of messenger RNA, which leaves the nucleus, goes into the cytoplasm, finds a ribosome, and then it threads through it. And as it threads through it, it, it is read. And each um, 
triplet of uh, the RNA is, is uh, read and the appropriate um, amino acid is synthesized for that. And they all come out looking like uh, one next to the next, and uh, like pearls or beads on a necklace. The uh, components of nucleic acids. So let's see. The polymers are called polynucleotides. Um, each polynucleotide has many monomers. Uh, the monomers are called nucleotides. Uh, the nucleotide has a nitrogenous base, a pentose sugar, and one or more phosphate groups. Um, if the nucleotide does not have the phosphate group, then it's not called a nucleotide. It's called a nucleoside. Okay. Um, there are two kinds, uh, the two families of nitrogenous bases: the pyrimidines and purines. Pyrimidines have uh, a single six-membered ring, and those would be cytosine, thymine, and uracil. The purines um, have a six-membered ring fused to a five-membered ring, and those are the adenine and guanine. Um, in DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. In RNA, the sugar is ribose. Okay, so we just need to remember that. Um, here's a picture of nucleic acids. Um, on the right, you see the bases, the pyrimidines and the purines, and you see the sugars, the ribose and the deoxyribose. And then uh, from these, uh, we construct units, um, the sugar and the phosphate group, and then the nitrogenous base, and it becomes um, a DNA strand like this. And so you have the sugar and the phosphate base, and the sugar and the phosphate, and then it keeps on going to become a backbone, and then um, the uh, purines and pyrimidines stick out in the center of it. Um, so nucleotides are linked together uh, to become a polynucleotide, and adjacent nucleotides are joined by phosphodiester linkages. So not ester, but phosphodiester because there's a phosphate group which links the sugars of the two nucleotides. And this creates the backbone of the sugar phosphate units with their nitrogenous bases as appendages. Okay, so here again are the nitrogenous bases, and here are the sugars, and, um, and DNA molecules have two polynucleotides that spiral around an imaginary axis and they form a double helix. The backbones run in opposite directions from five prime to three prime. Um, so the arrangement is called anti-parallel. One DNA molecule will contain many, 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 many genes. Another depiction of DNA uh, on the left, five prime, uh, going all the way down to three prime. Um, and then at the bottom, you can see the antisense strand going from five prime to three prime. Um, you see in the, the middle of the picture, the base pairs joined by hydrogen bonding and uh, the sugar phosphate backbone is represented by a smooth blue ribbon. Um, and you can also say that uh, tRNA, which is transfer RNA, um, is uh, formed in a similar way. Uh, so this, to summarize nucleic acids, nucleic acids store, transmit, and help express genetic information. That's what they're for. They are composed of monomers called nucleotides, where there's a phosphate group, a sugar, and a, a nitrogenous base. And uh, there are two examples, DNA and RNA. DNA stores uh, hereditary information. RNA um, is, generally speaking, is just carrying instructions from the DNA um, to the cytoplasm to construct uh, the protein that is needed. So uh, when we uh, have all this wonderful information, um, studying it is difficult to, to put in uh, the big concept of biology. So there are subgroups or subdisciplines um, which uh, branch off of this, which just specialize in just this kind of information. So um, uh, there are disciplines called bioinformatics, genomics, proteomics, and that those came from uh, decoding the DNA. Um, because bioinformatics uses computer software and computational tools to deal with the data that results from sequencing many genomes. So there's a comparison of genomes, and that's what bioinformatics does. 
um, when you analyze a large set of genes or you compare whole genomes of different species, that's called genomics. Um, a similar analysis of large sets of proteins would be called, therefore, proteomics. And that also is a nice new field. Um, so we can use DNA and proteins as tape measures of evolution because you can actually look at the sequences and you can then, therefore, you can look and see, well, is this present? Is this sequence present in how many species? And how far back did we go with this sequence? And so some proteins are coded for by all organisms. And so you see that those are there in every single one and they're not changed. Um, so um, the sequences of genes and their protein products actually will document the hereditary background of an organism. And the linear sequences of DNA molecules are passed from parent to offspring. So we can extend the concept of m molecular uh, genealogy to relationship between species like this. And so here is, um, we're comparing a human, monkey, and gibbon, and we have a small species, small uh, sequence of um, amino acids um, and uh, beta globulin, beta globin, sorry. And uh, you can see that they're very, very small changes. So um, the one doesn't mean anything, that just means we're starting from here. Um, and uh, when you look at the human alignment, it's V-H-L-T-P-E-E-K-S-A. Um, but when you look at the monkey um, alignment of amino acid sequence, you see it looks exactly the same until you come to the end. And instead of a KSA, it's a KNA. And then in the gibbon, you'll see that there is no change from human to uh, gibbon. So that sequence, that particular part, is exactly the same. And you can go down um, all the entire genome of these three species, and you can start making comparisons, see how, how similar are we to um, a monkey or a gibbon. And um, there are some differences that result from just one protein change. So let's see if we can see what this is. Um, probably not, but let me just check. Molecules gone wild. Bio style. Carbohydrates provide the energy for your life. The simplest form like glucose is known as a monosaccharide. Combine two and make a larger sugar called disaccharide. The largest is a polysaccharide. Lipids are the fats. Three fatty acids with the glycerol makes up the fats. Triglycerides with only single bonds are saturated fats. But if they're double bonds, they now become unsaturated fats. Don't eat too much fat. Monomers build two polymers filled with CHO. Molecules macro. One with HO, other with HO. Bond and go. Release H2O. Dehydration synthesis is underway. Molecules gone wild. Biocell. Ma, 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 ma. Molecules gone wild. Bio style. Ma, 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 ma. Molecules gone wild. Hey! Many polymers. Mers, mers, mers. Molecules gone wild. Hey! Many polymers. Mers, mers, mers. Proteins, the building blocks that make up your whole body. Your skin, your hair, your muscles need proteins to get the hottest. Break down polypeptide to amino acids in your body. Nitrogen comes to the party. Nucleic acids. The famous one is DNA that's known by all you kids. With two polynucleotide changelings to make it valid. Which breaks into single nucleotides when it's digested. Phosphorus added. When you eat food, you get in the mood, molecules will flow straight down your throat. Need to break those big polymers, so here's H2O. Split to HNO. Hydrolysis is what I just now display. Hey, 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 hey. 
Molecules gone wild. Bio style. Ma, 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 ma. Molecules gone wild. Bio style. Ma, 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 ma. Molecules gone wild. Hey! Many polymers. Mers, mers, mers. Molecules gone wild. Hey! Many polymers. Mers, mers, mers. Who the four? So that was just a summary wrap up. Wrap. So uh, on molecules, on the biological molecules. Goodbye, students. <laughs>